Hello and welcome to the Monday, June 24th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Stockheim, Germany. Quick diary from Didi. Over the weekend, there is a new major version of Sys Internals Process Monitor. This is version 4, actually exactly 4.01 that was released. In addition to some performance improvements and user interface changes, there's also a new event when a particular process started that can be used now to sort and filter. Definitely useful if you are, for example, looking at an incident and try to figure out what happened after a particular time on a system. And overall, I don't really try to cover politics much here, but uh, sometimes it does affect what we have to do. And uh, one such event is the possible ban of the sale of Kaspersky in the US. The most immediate effect of this may be that Kaspersky may no longer offer updates to anti-malware definitions. And of course, that's the lifeblood of uh, these tools. And as a result, you probably must change to a different tool fairly soon if you no longer receive any updates. Overall, of course, now how important is it or how dangerous is it to run Kaspersky antivirus? Nobody really can say for sure. The big problem with tools like this is that they do have very intimate access to your system. They are often implemented as rootkits, which uh, they need in order to be able to intercept uh, malware functionality. And uh, that, of course, makes it very important that no matter what antivirus tool you're running, that you are trusting the particular vendor. So it's not just that they may be blind, for example, uh, to a particular group of malware, but it's also that uh, the anti-malware solution itself uh, could act malicious or just, and we have seen this many times in uh, different anti-malware solutions, that there are, for example, vulnerabilities in these anti-malware solutions that then help an attacker to actually gain the elevated access that these tools have over your systems. A digital supply chain company, Eclipsium, has identified a vulnerability in the UEFI implementation by Phoenix. Phoenix is not really sort of a household name when it comes uh, to uh, companies, but as you're booting your system, you may have seen the name flash on the screen as the UEFI firmware is uh, being loaded. The vulnerability identified by Eclipsium is a buffer overflow as a specific configuration parameter is loaded and it could lead to arbitrary code execution. The way an exploit would work is that an attacker has some access to the system. The attacker does not need physical access to the system. Remote access is sufficient. And then as the system is being booted, the attacker would set the tcg2 underscore configuration parameter to a value with an overly long size. As then later the system is rebooted again, that would trigger the buffer overflow and could lead to arbitrary code execution. The Phoenix UFI firmware that's vulnerable is used with a wide range of Intel CPUs. So if you're not running an Intel CPU, you're probably not affected. In order to get an update for this vulnerability, you need to contact the maker of your uh, system. So for example, this was identified first in systems made by Lenovo. Lenovo has come up with respective firmware updates. Updates. Other vendors may be affected as well. There is sort of no conclusive list here as part of the blog post that I could find. I recommend just well double check if there is some kind of UEFI firmware update for your system. 
if you're affected, if you're not affected, it's not a bad idea to occasionally check for updated firmware. Sadly, this is not always that easy and applying these updates is also not always that easy. Depends very much on the particular system where you're applying the update often requires like rebooting from USB sticks and such. So check with your vendor for any details. Now let's look at a couple of miscellaneous updates that we have that are noteworthy. For example, an update to GhostScript. GhostScript is often used to manipulate PDFs, uh, originally more PostScript, but uh, of course PDFs are now much more common than uh, PostScript. This update does fix a number of code execution vulnerabilities. And the Python JS to Py vulnerability suffers from a so far unfixed code execution vulnerability. Now, JS to Py does attempt to do something that's inherently dangerous. It does load JavaScript and then executes that as Python code inside a sandbox. The intent of uh, this module is to be used, for example, as part of web scrapers, where they often do need to parse uh, JavaScript. As I said, there's no patch available for this vulnerability, and there is now a proof of concept available by the individual who identified the vulnerability in part to put pressure on the JS2Py maintainers to apply a patch that was released for this vulnerability. Overall, I would highly recommend if you are scraping web pages like this, don't execute code in a sandbox or not in a sandbox that you're loading from random web pages. It's never really going well to do stuff like this. There have been multiple vulnerabilities in packages similar to this that allowed for unrestricted code execution and sandbox escape. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking and subscribing and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.